<laughs> yeah, bravo. So, yes, this is the 20 year anniversary. I'm not going to go into the whole history, but this whole area would not be wooded if it weren't for citizens taking action over many, 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 many years since the 1960s, all the way up until 2003 when they passed the Forest Preserve Ordinance. And that pretty much wrapped it up, we thought. <laughs> and there were lots of people, some are here, Paul Downs, thank you very much for all your work. <laughs> and he was part of all of those years of trying to protect the forest. Anyway, so we're, we have this really strong protection for the forest all the way up to the level of Congress. And we have this idea of a train that would go through there all the way to Northway Fields and beyond if you know where Northway Fields, so Northway Fields would no longer exist. And we'd be heading all the way up to Bark. So we lose a lot of our forest, we lose a lot of our quiet, we lose a lot of what makes Greenbelt Greenbelt. So this is a celebration year, so we're going <laughs> to celebrate by getting to know our forest better. So this is a winter ecology hike, and we are so happy to have Bradley Simpson here from Nature Forward. Nature Forward used to be Audubon Naturalist Society, and they do amazing work as Nature Forward still. They offer great educational programs and do just a, a whole host of things. I can't possibly list them all. But Bradley is the restoration manager at the Wood End Forest. Wood End Sanctuary. Sanctuary. And um, so he restores wildlife habitats there. And I'm going to hand it over to Bradley at this point. Um. So yeah, uh, just a little bit of history, a little bit on the Audubon Natural Society thing. So we're, our organization popped up in 1897, started by a lot of Audubon societies at that time. were started by a woman who wanted to boycott the use of bird feathers in apparel. So you have tons of Audubon societies popping up. For the reason the Migratory Bird Treaty um, Act got signed, this was all before women had the ability to vote, which is amazing. We took over Wood End in Chevy Chase in the 1960s from um, a woman who was a part of our organization, donated her property to us when she passed. And I work in their forest every day, and I'm going to be here talking about the trees that you all have, which personally I'm jealous of. Uh, the forest at Wood End is younger, much younger, and doesn't have a lot of oaks. I've tagged 4,000 trees in that forest, and I've only seen uh, 10 oaks. Um, and not many hickories. This forest here is much more of an older oak hickory forest and it has a lot of those special species that are missing from the younger wood end forest. So, um, really cool things to see today. Um, so this is in our um, cypress family. It's a juniper, common name eastern red cedar. And despite the name cedar, it's not related to our true cedars. True cedars are only native to um, Eurasia and North Africa, uh, but we have lots of junipers that have the cedar in the common name, even though it's a misnomer, it's not correct. So this is in the cypress family. It has these blue little berry-like combs on them, but they're not berries, they're combs. They're a naked seed, um, so they're, despite the, the, us calling them berries, they're not. And then you might also see some galls on some of the stems. And then we'll look at the spruce there, the, the Norway spruce, and uh, we'll, that's in our true pine family with our hemlocks, our cedars, our pines, our spruces, our firs are in that family. So we're going to look at the spruce. You can see the big cones, so much more reminiscent of our pine family. Um, so the, the needle or the leaves on our juniper, they're not, they're not needles, they're like scale-like. They're more similar to like the scales of a reptile, um, is how the, the leaves look on there. Here we have needles. This is likely a uh, cultivar, um, Picea abies pendula, uh, pendula, pendulous drooping. Picea abies, Picea is the genus name for spruce. Abies is its um, species name, so it's Norway spruce. Um, from Central Europe and up to Scandinavia. 
This one's obviously planted. Um, uh, this, uh, this species of pine is planted quite frequently uh, everywhere uh, in Maryland, in the state, in the eastern U.S. Kind of more, one of our more abundant pine species, but it's all, only native to the coastal plain, and because of their branching, they're a favorite nest site for bald eagles. Oh. These trees can get to 150 feet tall. And so when you identify pines, you want to look at the needles and how many are held together in a cluster. Um, I'll go ahead and say botany in and of, in of itself is a new language, is another language filled with Latin and Greek roots. So this, uh, what we call here a cluster of needles, is uh, a fascicle. Um, so it'll ask you how many needles per fascicle. Here we have five. This is the only species in our region with five needles held together. Um, so we're at one of our first large oaks. Um, most of our oaks we know are lobed leaves. They have leaves like this, where they have these things called lobes, and the gaps between the lobes are a sinus. Um, this is uh, not the leaf of this tree, <laughs> but I just wanted to show what an oak leaf usually looks like, because this one's a little bit different, the fact that it's one of our two species that don't have lobed leaves that are native to Maryland. Uh, these leaves resemble maybe a willow tree, which is why it's called willow oak. Uh, for this fellows, um, has leaves that resemble the leaves of a willow. So that's why they give it that name. Um, a, kind of a lighter gray, and these forming these little plates, these little blocky parts we want to talk about because of this. Um, Pin oak has a leaf more similar to the first one I showed. Really? Yeah, so there are many, many, many species of oaks. They are split into two main groups. You have the white oak group and the red oak group. The um, red oak group, like this one, their lobes, their points are very pointed. The ends of their lobes are very pointed. And they have this little hair-like feature called a bristle tip. And it's the vein of the leaf extending beyond the um, margin of the leaf to form a hair-like feature. All red oak group species have that feature. White oak group species are going to be very rounded and they don't have these little hair-like features on them at the tip of the leaves. Um, I wanted to stop here and appreciate our really large oak. Um, so just based off of the, the bar characteristics here, we can already put it in the red oak group. It's much more of a darker, darker gray. Up towards the top, you get these long, like, um, stripes pattern, um, usually, uh, um, described or related to, like, a ski slope, like the, like, the tracks skis make on a ski slope. And then it forms a little bit more of a blocky pattern here. Um, I believe, uh, this would be a scarlet oak, based off of what the bark is. More of a deeply lobed. Um, lobes coming in, uh, they kind of curve back in towards each other, forming a what is called like what is referred to as a C shape. And the northern red oaks have like a U shaped lobe. How old do you think that tree is? Old. Oh. <laughs> One seventy five. One. Probably. He's just looking on a tree. Can you guys come up and just... So this tree here, unfortunately the English ivy on it, um, uh, this is a uh, tulip tree. Lyrodendron tulipifera. Maybe sometimes uh, thought or known as like a tulip poplar or a yellow poplar. Uh, the name is, like, our, like I said about common names, is inaccurate. Um, poplars relate to a genus of trees of populus, which is in the willow family, so like our aspen, our cottonwoods. So it's more related to our really big blossomed magnolias. Some of them are even flowering now than native ones. 
Um, so this, with the nice, really big blooms, the really big yellow flowers, uh, is much more similar to the flowers that we see of our other magnolia trees. So this is the only tree in this genus native here into the United States. Um, there's only one other tree in the genus in the world, and it's in Eastern Asia, um, Leogentrin octometallus. It is a host plant for the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. Um, it's a really cool looking, beautiful butterfly. Mm. There's um, four main species, Eastern Tiger, the Black, the Spicebush Swallowtail, and the Zebra Swallowtail, which has wings that look like uh, the stripes of the zebra. So the pawpaw is the zebra swallowtail, the spicebush and the sassafras are the spicebush swallowtail. Um, and they have, yeah, so they have very important relationships with our really beautiful butterflies. This tree obviously came down recently. You can see the buds that are look fresh. And uh, if you can point out to people who passed, here's an acorn that was going to fall off. And, uh, coming fall. There's an acorn there. This looks like to be a scarlet oak based off the leaves. When you say recently, like within the last year or last five years? Ooh, I mean like in the last couple weeks. What? The the buds are so fresh. I mean these these things look like they I mean the leaves are still on. Significant wind and storm. Wow, this must have come back especially this in the last six this might have come down in the last few weeks? Wow. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, obviously, you can see the fungus on it. I, it was not horribly healthy uh, and probably contributed to it um, being uh, felled more easily. Yeah. But I just want to point out, because uh, we have some classic examples of our uh, red oak group leaves. Imagine the forests of the eastern U.S. were always in different stages of succession. You had mature forests with the oaks and hickories. You had forests that just went through a fire, so it's just like these old grasses and wildflowers. You have some that are mostly eastern red cedar and black cherry and black locust, and in some parts they're a tulip tree. Um, they go through that successional stage before they reach here, from the open to the shrubby scrubby, um, to you get the tulip trees in, and each species of plant sets the stage of the forest for the next species and makes it uh, less habitable for them uh, going forward. So tulip trees cannot grow in the shade, so they shade themselves out and baby oaks and hickories are growing in that shade and when a tulip tree falls, the oaks and hickories shoot up and take over the um, canopy. Uh, so this is obviously in the oak hickory stage. You can look out and see hundreds of, and thousands of oaks and hickories, way more than what you see at wood end. Um, and they're, the, the nuts of the trees are very, very important for a lot of the wildlife. One white oak tree can support thousands of native insects. And in terms of just um, Lepidoptera species, butterflies and moss, 500 species supported by white oak trees. Um, not, that's not even considering the, the beetles, the ants, the wasps, the parasitoid wasps that have such um, important relationships. And caterpillars are important because um, of how many birds need to eat to feed their little babies in the spring. A chickadee, those little tiny chickadees, will need about 7,000 caterpillars for one healthy brood of chicks. Oh. As one chickadee, as one chickadee family. We have chickadees everywhere. That's a lot. <laughs> so, without the white oaks, we would never have enough caterpillars to have healthy bird populations. I will mention quickly some uh, species that are here. And, it, and we can also uh, look at these species and make assumptions on the quality of the soil. We passed a little ground cover we'll see a few times um, throughout the trail, throughout our walk, called partridge berry. Michelle Repent, it's not a woody plant technically. Um, it's an herbaceous plant, perennial herbaceous plant with evergreen leaves. We also have um, our woody mountain laurels, call me a lot of folia. Um, we have some young uh, blueberries here, some short blueberries. Um, in the vaccinium genus, hard to say if they're the deer berry or if they're um, blue ridge blueberry. 
And there's also some pine bush blueberry around as well. All of these species that I mentioned, except for the partial berry, is in a uh, plant family called the Aracas Aracaceae, the heat. Blueberries, um, rhododendrons, azaleas, the mountain laurels are all in that family. And they all need acidic soil. So the fact that they're here tells me the soil here is quite acidic. So I think it's more so related to um, past trees that were here. So probably related to a density of pines. Pine needles are acidic. And pines, again, are one of the species that will set the stage successionally for future species, and that's acidifying the soil. That's a good one, uh, a grapevine, very shreddy, peeling. Uh, there's some much larger grapevines here, they like the forest edge, they like a little more sun. Um, they do have to make the grapes, they're delicious. Um, there's like seven species of native grapes here. Um, the lookalike is our invasive porcelain berry. Um, it's, in the, it's in the grape family, but a different genus. Um, but the bark is much tighter and blocky, it doesn't shred um, like so. And this scaly bark tree here is our native black cherry. So again, uh, very typical of our more disturbed forest edges. They like sun. Uh, this is probably the most disturbed part of the forest, I have to guess. Because this is all not native bush honeysuckle. Uh, but we're not focusing on that today. Black cherry, our native black cherry. These are great trees. They do make edible cherries. Um, you never eat the pit of a cherry, right? Because it has cyanide in it. Um, so you can actually like rub the stem of a black cherry and kind of get that bitter almond smell. That's the lovely sign. It's not like not at any concentration that would be harmful, but it does give it a very characteristic smell. And it has this like little scaly bark. We do have plenty of non-native cherries here, uh, but their bark doesn't become scaly. We're stopping here at this really blocky bark tree. Uh, this is a persimmon. Oh! Yeah, so if you like persimmon. These ones are a little bit more bitter than the ones you find in the grocery store, but they're uh -huh. delicious nonetheless. It has this very characteristic blocky bark. It starts to get blocky, like very, very young. The only other tree you'd probably confuse it with is our black gum that we saw earlier, but it'll never get to this degree of darkness. The ones that fall voluntarily and on the ground, like fresh, those are those are really sweet. Yeah. If you try to pick yeah. it off the tree, they're not sweet. Right, you gotta wait for them to fall. It's the same with the pawpaw. Yeah. You gotta like shake the tree. Shake the tree. And if they fall off Gentle without thing. pulling them off, then they're they're ready. Pawpaws are only ripe for three to four days. Oh. You really gotta find the right time. <laughs>